How do, you, how do you start an agency at age 16 with clients like Dell, Oprah Winfrey Show, Kroger, Apple, PG, Johnson & Johnson, American Eagle? That's quite a, quite a list. Tina Wells has been one of Essence's 40 Under 40. She's the academic director for Wharton's Leadership in the Business World program at Penn, and she's founder of Buzz Marketing Group, an agency she found at age 16. But you know what? She's adding to a resume that she's now coming to the Stacking Benjamin Show. Well, if you've ever read Honest Jew, Mackenzie Blue, or The Z Files, you know our next guest, Tina Wells, joining us at the card table. How are you? Hi, Joe. I'm so happy to be at the card table. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy you're here because, uh, well, it, I mean, there's so much here to unpack, Tina, that I really want to talk to you about. I've got, you know, about 25 minutes to talk to you and probably six hours of questions. But I want to start with this, this, this cool thing at eight. I still can't get over as long as I've known your story that you started a business at age 16. And as I was diving into that, um, you, this all started with a job at the New York Times. Like, how do you get a job at the New York Times at age 16? That's my biggest question. I've never heard answered. Well, first of all, it's the new girl times. So oh, the that's, new the girl answer. Time. <laughs> that's the answer you've been looking for. <laughs> it's a newspaper for girls out of New York City. <laughs> that part is accurate. Um, and you know the story. I answered an ad in the back of Seventeen magazine back in 1995. And that was the start of a career I never even thought I was starting. Right. I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to be a fashion writer. So the new girl times was, felt like a really good way to get there. And instead it led me to a career in marketing and market research and, you know, something I love for over 20 years. And so now you have the answer to your burning question. <laughs> it's new girl times, new not girl New York times. times. Yes. It's, it's funny because I probably even read new girl times, Tina, five different places. And I still in my head went yeah. New York times. Yes. But I mean, well, good, good marketing name for them, right? That they knew people were going to do well, it's still led, I bet, to a ton of New York Times mentions because you grew this thing. So there's one thing to start this thing that you're passionate about, right? I mean, you like reviewing products and helping girls at the time. But how mm -hmm. do you grow that into a fully fledged business? You know, I think there's a common thread throughout my career, which is this idea of being at the right place at the right time, you know, and understanding where culture was moving. And so if you think back to where we were in the late 90s, the biggest thing that was emerging was this new teen explosion in music, right? So Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, in sync, And then you move into the early 2000s, you have Teen People, Teen Vogue, uh, L Girl, all these like teen, you know, Aeropostale explodes, Abercrombie explodes, right? And so I kind of rode that teen wave. And then what starts to happen in the early 2000s? Everyone starts to talk about this new customer called a millennial, right? And all the teenagers I had been studying for the last decade graduated from college, grew up and became millennials, the largest demographic in history at the time. And so I happened to be at the right place at the right time when a few people, right, who understood them because when they were, when it was youth marketing, it was a niche thing, right? Then when all of these people became adults and we realized we really have to know how to talk to them, I was, you know, positioned at the right place, became known as the millennial whisperer. Um, but it was not anything I could have predicted in that way. I think it was really just being in the right place at the right time. Well, I think it's one thing to be there. It's another thing to recognize that you're there. Then that's a whole different interview, by the way, because I want to now fast forward. You've had this business for 11 years. As we said, when we introduced you, you're working with some of the biggest brands on earth. But tell me about you at age 27. What did that look like? Yeah, so by 27, you're right, 11 years into business, um, I, you know, at 25, I had a cover story with Oprah's Magazine, which was a game changer for me at the time. And I just go into this work mode, right? I'm super grateful for my career at this point. And all I want to do is like crush everything, right? It was the hustle time, I had an office in New York City. And what I didn't realize was that I was heading toward my first burnout. You know, I didn't even know or have the language for that. At that age, I just thought you leave college, you work really hard, and you continue to scale and build, you know? And so, uh, yeah, you're right. 11 years into it, it was my first burnout. I didn't know what to do. And I, I was very fortunate to have a friend who said, you need to come on a vacation and your laptop's not invited. 
for a lot of people that are listening, they might not like their job. You hear these statistics, Tina, that 70% of people don't like their job and they're suffering from burnout. In fact, you cite this in your work in a 2022 Gallup poll of more than 12,000 workers. They found that about 76% of workers report experiencing some sort of burnout on the job. But it's not just people that dislike their job or they dislike what they do. For you, I mean, your passion, you, you loved what you do, it sounded like. I did. I've always been very fortunate to love the work that I was doing. Um, and But I was often accused by my friends and family and very, rightfully so of just working all the time, you know. And when you like my job was really discovering culture, explaining culture, it was a really fun, fascinating job. And it was something I could actually do every day, all day. Right. I could sit down at night and watch TV to disconnect and still, you know, quote unquote, be doing my job, you know, and so figuring out how to create work life harmony is a lifelong, you know, assignment for me. And I think often you hear of writers writing the books that they need. I definitely need this book. You know, I definitely expect that there are going to be readers who can live the elevation approach better than me. Right. They're going to be giving me tips on my own approach. But I write and I use these tools every single day. Well, speaking of the tools, let's get into it. Was it at 27? Was it on that vacation that you began dreaming up the elevation approach? I think what I really talk about is it took me, I would say, even after the first time of understanding I needed a new way, it took me about another 12 years in business to really perfect it. I would say the last two to three years, I've really gotten a rhythm um, around it, but it really took like I discovered that I needed to add recreation, right? So I, I explained there are four phases in the elevation approach, preparation, inspiration, recreation, and transformation. I think I spent the first 11 years of my career in preparation and inspiration, right? So I come up with a big idea, do the work behind it, get super inspired and just stay in this loop, right? And I was never bringing things fully to the transformation phase or to life and I couldn't understand why. And when I started to bring recreation, that was a game changer. But then all I did was use it as a way to do more of the first two phases, right? So it really just was like, oh, I'm working out. Well, working out isn't really recreation, right? That probably, for me, it belongs in preparation. And so I was doing things that I thought were relieving stress and doing what I needed to do, and it just wasn't working. So it took me a long time to figure that piece out. Well, let's walk into how this is different than 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 work life balance because you draw a clear distinction early on, Tina, that this is not about work life balance. It seems to me you really have a problem with this word balance. What's funny is is you're not the only one that has a problem with the work life balance. I was watching a TikTok video literally this morning before we recorded and there was some some guy you know from hustle culture right and 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 i think what you're talking about is the anti-hustle culture but 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 he's talking to this audience tina and he's going steve jobs didn't have work-life balance beyonce doesn't have work-life balance like work-life balance is for them your job is to get out there and hustle and get it i i think you agree with balance is the problem but maybe not with the rest of that no, I think, you know, we all realized maybe even during the pandemic that the way we were working wasn't working for us. Right. And so even though there was a lot of anxiety during the pandemic, there were a lot of things that kind of drove us a little bit crazy. One of the things I think we started to enjoy was how we could work and then see our families. Right. So we could go on Zoom, we could do the recordings and then go have lunch together. Right. So there became this idea of like, wow. There's a different way that we can live, um, you know, and I think there are several people who have been talking about work life harmony. You know, I think Jeff Bezos famously gave a talk about work life harmony. Um, and for me, what, when you th say balance, if you think about a scale, what that ultimately means is if you have a ton of work, let's say you're in a season where, you know, you're in the final months of your Ph.D. or, you know, you're working on an end of quarter review, there is ultimately going to be more work on that scale. To balance it, that means you instantly have to add more life on that scale, right? And then you just keep doing these two things. And what happens? You've just got a ton of things on your scale. So the goal isn't to keep adding more until everything's balanced, right? Sometimes you need a lot less of everything. Um, but what you really want and what Harmony speaks to is that it's almost like a plate, right? It's like building the perfect meal. Only you know that recipe for you and your life. And all the flavors, all the things on that plate work together. Right. So you're not overloading the plate. It's, it's exactly what you want on that plate, but it's also 
craft it in a way that makes the most sense for you. So for some of us, it could mean that you're working a lot, but that your plate has all the other things that, that you need to feel whole, whatever that means, right? And so you add in just the right amount of recreation and and all of that is to fuel your productivity in the way that feels healthy for you, right? Where it's not overload. And I have to be honest and say, when I started to incorporate recreation, you know, in my mind, I was like, ah, but I'm, I'm wasting time. I should be doing the work. And I right. might come out yeah. of a, like just a walk just to enjoy a really nice sunny day and didn't even realize I was processing a problem or something that, ir- not even a problem, maybe you just had something, an irritating meeting at work or an irritating phone call. And that 15 minutes of disconnecting, you're like, I don't know what, what I was upset about, but I'm not anymore, right? That your body just kind of worked through it. And so when I realized it actually helped with productivity, which is kind of a, you know, I want you to have It feels like a paradox. Habit. It feels yeah. like a paradox. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think for me, it, I do sometimes struggle with the idea of recreation, especially in a time when you feel like I should be hustling like you were just speaking to that podcast, right? I should be hustling it out. And it's like, even in those moments, where can you carve out an hour, 15 minutes, some time for yourself to really recalibrate and stay very focused on the goal, but do it in a way that you're not, you know, out of breath, out of energy, out of everything when you get to that finish line. I got the feeling as I was reading through the elevation approach, Tina, that this is, you know, a lot of people want to manage their calendar. They want to manage their time. This is really much more about managing your energy. It felt like, like you're not, you're not doing recreation because you deserve it or because it's some sort of ice cream treat. You're doing it because if you don't do it, everything comes out worse. Yes, Joe. I think that's an incredibly good point. Um, It is not this reward system, it's saying, I am doing this so I can stay in harmony. So I'm not burnt out when I get to transformation in what I want, right? Like the goal is to have enough, right? Have the things you want, but also be healthy enough to enjoy them. Because how many times do we hear about people getting the thing that they want and not finding any joy in it, right? So one of the overarching yeah. themes is creating joy. Uh, and I, I, I want to dive into especially the first piece, preparation, and then if people want to dive in more, we'll let them do that on their own. Absolutely. But uh, how has your day changed? Let, let, let's just talk about that. Like the way that Tina Wells sets up her day now with the elevation approach, how is your day different than it was back in 2005, 2006, 2007? Um, So I live my day. It's a very interesting question. Um, I live my day as the elevation approach, right? So my mornings are spent in preparation. um, And that's, we know like the instant elevations in those phases are uh, that phase around decluttering your space, getting curious, knowing your numbers, right? So I love consuming articles, research, news briefings, emails, getting in touch with my team all in the first part of my day. And then the second part of my day is when I love to take my meetings, right? That's when I'm, inspiration is about being out and about. Um, that's when I really feel like the most on at that part of my day. And then um, recreation comes for me as an afternoon break that I really need. Because even taking a little time to go grab tea, take a walk, it's a sunny day today, like just getting out allows me to come back and then tie my day together. You know, and so for me, working out is preparation. It's not recreation, right? If I do something in recreation, it's it would be like a slow flow or something that really is more of like moving my body in a way that just feels nice, not like crush it in the morning, you know, in preparation, you're like, I'm ready to crush the day. That is not the feeling at recreation. But, you know, in my business these days, I spend a lot of time working um, with teams in Asia. So I need that recreation at that point. Because then transformation helps me really tie the day together at the end of the day. You talk about, let's talk about recreation for a second, because a lot of people that are listening to this work for somebody else. They're not in complete control Mm -hmm. of their calendar. So uh, how do we start taking control and using the elevation approach if I work for somebody else? Yeah, so I think the first part of that is the language. You know, when I um, had my agency, I worked for a lot of other people, right? (laughs) And and, and so imagine going to clients and saying, I'm going to just block off half my week. And the way I phrased it was, you know, I prefer we want to set a standing meeting or call to do it Tuesday or Thursday. Um, You know, Wednesdays were the day I was normally in person with anyone. So I can meet you in person on Wednesdays. And I like to spend my Mondays and Fridays uh, in strategy because I really want to be thoughtful about your work. And the response, I couldn't believe it was, wow, 
you have two days on your calendar where you think about me. And, and so I love that idea that you are really doing the work, right? So I think it's explaining the process. So I think it's all in how you say it. You know, you certainly can't say, I need me time, right? But instead right. it's like, you know, that doesn't work. But if you're like, <laughs> if you can let me have this day or this time to do this, I can be so much more productive in this other, you know, these other times I'm going to be so focused on what I need to do I'm going to be better serving you. I'm not going to be burnt out doing the work. Let's try it for a week or two. If it doesn't work for you, can we revisit that? Right. So I think it's all in how you phrase it, but you certainly can't go in and say, I need me time. How do I put that on my calendar? So as I hope all of our stackers are hearing, this all begins really with your goals. I th- you point out very strongly that you really have to know what you're after, which fuels you. And for somebody who's worked a career, Tina, of fulfilling everybody else's dreams, right? You, the people around you, that might be a little difficult. How do we begin choosing these, these correct goals and make them actionable and usable? Yeah. And I, I, again, you bring out a great point with the book, which is I am asking you to really get to know you right? Because I can't explain for you what work-life harmony means. You have to figure that out, which means you have to know what you want. And I also think it's really important to release yourself from goals or ambitions you might've had that served you for the last 15, however many years of your life. If those things have changed post-pandemic, I also think it's an invitation to be honest about that, to be honest that you want something new, um, and then to really get clear about how you're going to get it. But it's hard, you know, to set goal setting and you're, you're trapped with old goals or you're not aware of how things are changing. And so um, it, it is really a deep dive into who you are right now at, at this stage, given all that we've all collectively been through. I think it's a good time to take a pause and say, hey, the things I wanted before, are they still the things I want right now? I'm going to get on my pedestal for just a second with our community, because if if you just listen to what Tina said and you glossed over it, This is when we talk about retirement planning back when I was a financial planner. um, It's the part that so many people go, yeah, yeah, I don't really care about that. Let's just talk about the funds. Let's talk about the money. Let's talk about the, if if you don't have, every study shows that if you don't have these concrete goals of what you want, you're not going to live as long. You're not going to be as healthy. You're not going to achieve as much. There's just so, there's so much there, Tina. And yet there's this portion of our audience that I always have trouble getting through to. They're like, no, no, no. I want to talk about how mutual fund works. It does. It, it truly doesn't matter if we don't get this piece. You, you, you have these four phases that you mentioned earlier, preparation, inspiration, recreation, and transformation, which phase we start with. You said you can start wherever you want, but let's just go into preparation. The first one you started with your health. So yeah. how did you use the preparation phase then, just as an example, to get moving on health and wellness? Uh, yeah, so one of the key principles of instant elevation is this idea of knowing your numbers, right? And I'll give you one number, um, my sleep score, right? I wear this aura ring every day um, for accountability around sleep because one of the things we like to tell ourselves is, I got enough sleep, I was fine, I feel fine, right? And When you have to deal with like a readiness score every morning, I feel like I wake up and get graded instantly, right? And so then I really was able to see, oh, I wasn't getting enough sleep. I got to do more research about what do I need to do to be in a better zone and then start correcting that so I could be way more productive, you know, in the time I wasn't sleeping. And so if I didn't have to deal with that number every day, I could lie to myself, right? And say, I feel good. It's just the time. Oh, you know, I'll get better next week. But instead I'm like, If I am not hitting my goal, I feel it instantly. I'm very connected to that. And I'm like, no, I have got to do what I got to do to make sure I'm getting that sleep. Um, And I think there are lots of numbers. You know, I also talk about tracking A1C and getting with doctors. You know, now I think this is a practice for many different doctors to um, help you with a lot of different numbers to understand just how you work and what you need more of. Um, but that was a huge learning curve for me once I started understanding those numbers and how they work together and how they keep me really um, as productive as, as possible. It became a piece of data that I just had to always have access to. Yeah. Preparation of data. I, I Frankly, I was surprised to see it in the book, which I don't know why, because as I was reading your words, Tina, I realized that as I'm presented with data, like as you're presenting yourself with your sleep data, you're learning so much about yourself, which makes you this, your consciousness level toward this goal goes through the roof then. Yes. And that's a, also a great point, right? It keeps you in touch with what you want. And so 
we're all wearing these devices. We've got our Apple watches and trackers and we're, we're all do, we're, we're counting steps, right? That's a really important marker. How much are you moving, right? We could have some days where we're like, why don't I feel great right now? And it's like, oh, because I'm used to moving X amount of steps per day. And the last couple of days, it's been less. Like that does affect how you feel, right? Where your body gets used to a certain kind of rhythm. And so um, again, it's it's just being conscious of saying, I want to do more of something and it keeps you accountable to whatever that is. You know, if it's, I want to cook dinner with my family. Okay, how are you tracking that? Easily on your calendar, a few X's when you have dinner at, at home as a family and you look at the end of the week and say, oh, I wanted it to be four nights and it was two and what happened, right? You're just asking yourself more questions. Maybe it was unavoidable to only, you know, have two, but at least you're having the discussion and you're not four months down the line saying, why do I feel this disconnection? It's like immediately in the moment, you know what's caused it and how to fix it. You talk about, uh, to, to that point, all kinds of different types of preparation that you do. Uh, mental prep, you begin with. What, what does mental prep mean? Oh, goodness. Um, there's so many different versions <laughs> depending on what, what stage you're at. Um, I think for me, though, the biggest piece of mental preparation might be the idea of decluttering my space, right? And what that looks like for all of us. Um, and we had an expert weigh into this chapter, and there are actually experts who weigh in on every single principle of instant elevation. And Michelle Morris, who has been a cleaning expert for 20 plus years, talked about the idea of like landing zones and identifying what they are in every room. And, and she made this and she's like, I'm, I'm surprised how, how so many people pile things on their desk instead of like making that a, like a no fly zone and having drawers or other things so that your eyes immediately see like a clean slate. Right. And so for me though, that's one of them, but mine is more my inbox, right? I need to have a process around really getting my inbox down because if I have a cluttered inbox, it makes it hard for me to like get moving, right? And I find the same thing if I'm cooking in the in the kitchen. I have to make sure like all the dishes like are either put away or have a process so I'm not starting with like a sink full of dishes because for some reason I can't start a cooking process if my surfaces don't feel like prepped and ready to go, right? You'll start to discover what those things are for you, but I think when you look at decluttering, you know, you'll start to de develop some habits that are just your habits there. And then and then physical preparation is next. I'm assuming that is your workout. That's your workout routine, your health and wellness routine? It is, but I'll give you one other little secret. Um, I started years ago. I, I have this ballet rack in my room for dressing where I actually prep clothes like a week in advance if I can. So it, I don't use a lot, like, I, I mean, the Sunday night for the following week, right? I'll take 30 minutes and say, what, what's on my calendar? Here's everything. So I don't waste time in the morning when, to be honest, I'm not as caffeinated as I'd like to be <laughs> trying to make a decision on what to wear, right? I like to do it when I'm like in my Sunday fun day. It's like I can, can try things on. Like that just became something I like to do because like, I don't know, I wake up and I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I putting on? Like, I like to have that sorted out. For the week. So that actually is a prep tool that's really helped me. That's that's fabulous. Uh, my favorite on the list being a financial podcast, Tina, financial prep you had on here. So I'm high fiving you. Yes. I mean, I think, again, knowing your numbers and it's about being honest with yourself. Right. So if you have goals, if you have money, you need to save Think like you have to be aware. Right. Looking at I have like week weekend money rituals that are fun, right? That are around like looking at different things. You know, one of the things I did this fall, right? In my day-to-day -day rituals or like my, mon you know, my mundane money ritual was looking at APR. And I was like, what in the world happened, right? You hear all these things, right? That interest rates are all, and then all of a sudden when you sit down and do your ritual, you're like, excuse me, this didn't look like this, right? And so it was a really funny thing. I'm like, Obviously, I've been hearing about this, but incorporating that into a ritual and then having to deal with the reality made some other things. It's like holiday season's going to look a little bit different, right? So I think those things are, are really important. You just took this idea of prep, which everybody is the first of four, and you turn it from this thing that sounds, oh, you mean I got to declutter? I got to work on my calendar. I got to, and just took it, Tina, and made it super fun. Like preparation sounds badass. It sounds like a great time. It's fun. And also my favorite thing to do, um, I love chiclet. I love thrillers. Uh, I'm a huge audiobook fan is I will put an audiobook on while I'm like prepping things for the week and doing it. 
while I'm cleaning, I will put an audio book on a podcast that I want to listen to. And that is, you know, you made an earlier point about what if you don't control your calendar? How do you add any of this into your life? And I think, you know, how do you own your commute? How do you own even five to 15 minutes of your day to infuse something you like to do, right? So laundry, for those of us who don't like laundry, laundry is a lot more fun when you can listen to a podcast or you can watch something, you know? So it's just finding those moments of infusing more of what you like into your day or into what we might call a very mundane activity. The book is The Elevation Approach, Harness the Power of Work-Life Harmony, Guys, not work-life balance, but work-life harmony to unlock your creativity, cultivate joy, and reach your biggest goals. And I believe it's available everywhere, Tina. Everywhere books are sold, yes. Tina Wells, thank you so much for joining us and helping our stackers get elevated. I super appreciate it. Thanks, Joe.